Hello and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. One nation bound in freedom, peace and unity are the closing lines of the first stanza of Nigeria's national anthem. They are the lines that many young Nigerian children whose school in the country are taught from very early on. However, increasingly in the face of political uncertainties, ethnic divisions and rising insecurity, many Nigerians seem to be questioning the basis of those lines. From the moderate interventionists who call for a sovereign national conference, to those who call for a referendum, to groups who seek an outright secession, at no time has the unity of Nigeria been more threatened than today. D.K. Chukumerije is an award-winning performing, performing poet, a prolific author, and a Nigerian enthusiast. That he is passionate about his father and is not in doubt, and that seems to have shaped the trajectory of his body of work. In the face of the many challenges facing the country, I ask him how firm his faith is in the survival of this country, Nigeria. Dike Chukumerije, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you for having me, Malbury. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm a little starstruck. <laughs> and I think that, you know, putting it very mildly, your body of work is quite impressive. Thank you. Thank you. But there's a challenge in times. I want to think that the religion which you preach, and this is without bias or prejudice to the faith that you profess, mm -hmm. but when one goes through your work, one might almost say that Nigeria is your religion. Where do you derive your faith from? And has it ever been shaken? Uh, I derive my faith mostly from the potential uh, in this nation of 200 million people, largest black nation on the face of the planet. And the fact that wherever you find Nigerians outside of Nigeria, they are at the top of their game, they are at the top of their industry. I believe very firmly that there is uh, a drive, a hunger, that Nigerians seem to have that just takes them to the top. And I keep imagining what it would be if we got our governance right a bit in the nation and the country, this we were allowed to actually drive forward. I believe that if Nigeria you know, was allowed to, that it would very easily rival any other nation in the world, simply because of the way Nigerians are. Mm. You know, so the, the potential is what gives me faith or what keeps renewing my faith. And I, I study a lot the history. And when I look at, a lot of times when people study history, they look at the mistakes our founding fathers make. When I study the history, I look at what they were looking at. What were their dreams? What were their aspirations? What were they looking at? And that also, you know, inspires me a lot. You know, so somebody like Zig, for instance, when he was fighting uh, part of the nationalist movement. One of the things that motivated them was the fact that they were fighting against a system of discrimination on the basis of skin color. These were people who had gone to school, you know, and found that they couldn't rise beyond a certain level because they were black, because they were Africans. And they wanted a country where they could be free. They didn't want to replace a system of discrimination on the basis of skin color with discrimination on the basis of tribe and religion. They wanted a country where the black man would have a platform to showcase to the world that he is not inferior to the white man, that he can do as much as the white man can do. So oftentimes when I read history, I read it through the purview of the way human beings, I know they stumbled, they fell, they made mistakes, but what were they looking at? And when through their eyes I see what they were seeing, it also motivates me to fight for what they fought for which was one Nigeria. Mm. Has your faith in that ever been shaken? I mean, there must have been times when you have questioned if this country was ever designed to be won. My faith has often been shaken. It's shaken, you know, every day. But I, I, I never, th that question was Nigeria designed to fail. It's not one that bothers me because... Uh, there, every, every country, in my own uh, worldview, every country is a construct, an artificial construct. There is no nation or state that is natural. Every nation or state was put together by a couple of people and has its contradictions, including the ones that are called developed. 
when you live in these nations, if you've ever had the opportunity of living in the UK or the US, you discover that they have very deep contradictions so that they have developed not because of any homogeneity between people, so to speak, but in spite of ethnic, religious, ideological, gender, sexual differences, they've developed in spite of their differences. So I have no doubt that in spite of Nigeria, Nigeria's diversity is not our problem. You know, but my faith is shaken by the fact that you can't keep... I feel time is running out, you know, and that we're making wrong decision after wrong decision, and we're slowly pulling, pushing the country towards a place where the inevitable will happen. So that is what worries me. It's mm. not, the potential is realizable. Mm. However, the decision makers are making decisions that are taking the country to the brink. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that really worries me. Mm. Do, do you ever see anywhere, in the midst of all the worry, in the midst of all the mistakes, any spark that sometimes inspires you? Yeah. Uh, my everyday life is full of sparks. You know, I, 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 I talk about it all the time. You know, I think of friendships, people that have helped me all through my life from, there is no, when it comes to the showing of care, affection, there is no division between race or tribe. I have been helped by people from other tribes and faiths. I've been harmed by people from my own tribe and my own faith. So I see that good and bad is not segmented on ethnic or religious terms. A good person is a good person, regardless of where he comes from or where she worships. You know, so every, every day, I mean, uh, I remember one time where I grew up in Lagos and my younger brother, uh, we used to live in a place called Ota, Songo Ota, on the border between Lagos and Ogun. And my younger brother was going to school in Ifako. You know, and once my mom was late in going to pick that him. That was quite a drive. Yeah. From Ota from, to Ifako, yeah, Bogada. It's a long drive, yeah. yeah. She was late in going to, to pick him, and he was really young, so he just came out and thought he could walk home and got lost in Lagos, in Lagos. And this woman who didn't know him from Adam just saw this little boy wandering on the road, a Yoruba lady, you know, took him, he was late in the night, took him home, fed him, gave him a warm bed to sleep in, traced our house and brought him home. This is not an isolated case. Things like this happen all the time. So we are capable as Nigerians of, of love. We are capable of the same heights of love you know, as any other human being any, anywhere else. So I see things like this every day that give me hope, you know, that there is nothing in us that says that we must destroy ourselves. It is the way we interpret our socioeconomic realities, the way we have been taught to see and interpret our socioeconomic problems that leads us to solutions that are not actually solutions. Mm. You know, so I feel it's the way we think. It's not anything innate in us that causes us to fight. Mm. I'm looking at, you have tried to trace even from that social political um, ev evolution or, you know, relationship, how it is that our founding fathers defined uh, their own social political relationship with Nigeria. And perhaps that explains how their own followers have interpreted it. Um, you, I think in, your, in this uh, spoken word performance of the evolution of Nigeria, uh, you talked about the three founding fathers. Uh, you also talked about how they define Nigeria and their relationship with the uh, country called Nigeria. You talked about ethnic federalism, regional federalism, yeah. and the cosmopolitan, uh, who says one Nigeria, as any Nigerian rep any Nigerian could represent, represent Nigeria, Nigeria or yeah. every Nigerian anywhere. Would you say that it is the manner in which we have practiced our politics that has brought up the divisions that we currently see? Yep. I mean, uh, identity, cultural identity is innate. You know, if you're born Yoruba, or you're born Igbo, as an Igbo person, you will always be partial to Osadebe if you hear his music. It will move you to dance. There are, kind, there are certain kinds of foods that would always appeal to you more than the other type of food. There, there are certain cultural peculiarities that are just natural and innate. But tribalism, which is where you, for instance, make a decision that 
somebody deserves something, has worked and merits something, but because that person comes from a different tribe from you, you're going to deny that person that thing that is theirs, you know, by virtue of how hard they've worked. That is a political system. It is not in it. It is not, it's not natural. You have to learn it. You have to be socialized into that system. So that in primary school, you just played with your, whoever sat beside you, in, 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 your, your desk mate. You didn't ask, what is your state of origin? Are you Christian? Are you Muslim? These things are things you have to learn. You have to be socialized into. And we have a system that specializes in turning us into tribalists. You know, so you have a system that is constantly asking you, what is your state of origin? Where do you come from? So even if you, you were born in Lagos, you grew up in Lagos or wherever it is you come, you have this constantly being reminded, you don't come from here, you come from there. And this is how you are supposed to behave. And this is how you're supposed to, you know, treat each other. So our system socializes us into becoming tribal. It's a pol I call it political tribalism. Because if you leave people, if you go into... A, a beer parlor to watch people watching Champions League or you, you, won't, you can't tell who comes from where. Everybody is supporting Chelsea or supporting Manchester and drinking beer. But the moment there is an election, people suddenly divide into these camps. And then when the election is over, they sit in the same bus, complain about the same corrupt politicians, complain about the same potholes. But whenever it comes to political decision making, we are wired to split into camps. So back to your question, yes, it is the political system. It is our political leaders, the choices they made, the structures they put in place that have conditioned generations of Nigerians to just walk a certain path. But, I mean, the other day, I think they're celebrating now that Boris uh, Johnson, the new UK Prime Minister, appointed a Nigerian to be... Yeah. Uh, um, a minister. Minister of something. And we're all celebrating it. This is somebody that clearly traveled to another person's country and has now been accepted into the political climate. And yet, if you start talking about, you know, non-indigenes being allowed to identify themselves as part and parcel of a state here, it becomes like you're talking about something from space. So how is it that we are so excited about the triumph in, in the UK over racism? And well, we're not willing to fight for the triumph over tribalism in our own. What's the difference? It's our mindset. Why do we believe that tribalism be, it is natural here, or racism is unnatural there? There's no difference. Treat people on the basis of their merit. It doesn't matter what the person's color or whatever, or, or, or you know, whatever it is, on the basis of the work of their hand. If I can do the work, you know, let me do it. If I do it properly, give me the reward. This is the only way a society can move forward. The only way a society can move forward is if you put your best foot forward Nobody goes into a, a plane and the first thing you, you ask is, who is flying this plane? Okay, the pilot is Alsa. The co-pilot must be Yoruba. Nobody does that because we want to arrive at our destination safely. If only if two, of them are, if two of them are even from the same mother, as long as they can fly the plane, that's all we care about. And yet we'll entrust the, our educational system, healthcare system, security system, and we entrust it to the hands of people on the basis of where they come from. And we wonder why our country is going down. Mm. It has nothing to do with diversity. It's the fact that you, for whatever reason, will not allow the, your best hands in, in critical sectors of your economy and society. Mm. If we do that, I'm not saying that tribalism will disappear, but I'm saying that our socioeconomic conditions will improve. The conversation over identity will continue. Whatever country we have, whether you, if we divide into six different countries in Nigeria today, the conversations of identity will continue in each of those countries because immediately the, country, the new country is divided, there will be a majority, there will be a minority, and the conversation over sectarianism will start all over again. So we're always going to have these conversations. Mm. But let us begin to prioritize merit over identity, and then we have hope. Mm. We're going to take a break at this period. You've been speaking more politically in recent times. I think you had a small article uh, on your ideas of how the ministerial screening uh, should have happened. Yeah. We'll take you up a, a bit on it. Now, let me ask you this very personal question. You come from a family, a 
I don't want to say political family, but your dad was a prominent Nigerian politician. Uh, he was a minister, uh, I think, under General Sani Abacha. And he was also a senator until he's, um, he eventually passed on. Did you ever wish that your dad did not work with General Sani Abacha? <laughs> he actually didn't. He worked under uh, IBB. Uh, General yes, but beg your pardon. Ibrahim, ba Ibrahim, Ibrahim, Ibrahim Babangida. Uh, I, I, I don't, because it, it was his life, you know, he made his choices. Um, I don't see myself as, uh, I'm very proud of my parents and where I come from, but I don't really have this typical Nigerian attitude. I don't see myself as a continuation of my father or there's a, a political legacy or dynasty. We're just raised to be very individualistic to sort of do your own thing. He did his own thing. He didn't consult me. He didn't ask me. You know, he lived his life the way he wanted to live it, followed his convictions, and just told me to follow mine, mm. you know? So he didn't put his biases, political or whatever biases on me, which I'm really grateful for. He really didn't. He just always gave you the opportunity to make up your own mind. Did he ever influence you, though, in any way, the fact that he was in government, the fact that you, um, did, I, did you become more politically conscious because that, it, he was in politics or he was in government? I, I would, yes, he made, uh, he made deliberate interventions in the lives of his children to make them more politically conscious. So for instance, as a child, he would make us all watch the evening news, the seven o'clock news and summarize it for him, you know, he would, encourage us all the time to read political biographies and autobiographies and he would all the time say listen it doesn't matter even raising getting married raising children this is all just but you have to contribute to your community to your, you have to make an impact on your world one way or the other you know and he was a journalist when i was growing up so and he loved books i used to do his book shopping uh, you know i used to go to lagos all these bookshops and buy books for him so all that influences you. It gives you a, a serious perspective. And, you know, he used to talk. We, we would have discussions about politics, particularly when I had become older, for instance, and he was in the Senate. Because when he was a minister, I was still in secondary school. You know, so I used to see him on TV like everybody Just wondering, else. did that influence your novel? Was that the basis of that novel? I mean, it was in, in, there was influenced by that entire time, yeah. June 12, the turmoil, everything. You know, I was, I was a secondary school student in, in Lagos at the time, so mm -hmm. I was in the heart of the turmoil. And as a son of a minister, it was a very interesting time for me because, uh, you know, it was... I, I didn't. I wasn't in the position people thought I was in. If you know what I mean, you know. Whenever Nigerians have these stereotypes, if you're the son of a big person, they just have. They have. They think they know where you're coming from, how you are, how you behave. But I'm just not at all that stereotype. So it used to amuse me, you know. So the book comes out of all, all of that, you know. So, but you know, as I grew, when when he was a senator, I think I, I had just left university, graduated from university. So I was, I was older. We could have conversations, and we would have conversations, you know. Um, and we had on on some issues, we would were in agreement on some issues, you know. Like sometimes I'll be like, "Why are you even in this system? The system is you're you're giving the system legitimacy. This is." And he would explain why he feels it's necessary for him to do this or do that. And I'll listen. And, and one, one thing I would say the experience has done for me is that I understand better. You see, not everybody in government is bad. There is a problem with the system. Even when a good intention person gets in, it's very hard for them to actually do any good because of the way the system is structured. So that sometimes you have to think of things in a systemic way. Mm. And not just attack individuals because... <laughs> A lot of people go in with good intentions, you know, but again, you need a critical mass of people to go in who have the same idea of how the system needs to be tweaked mm. because you cannot accomplish anything in government by yourself. There's no Superman or Batman in this thing. You need a, an entire network of people cutting across the three levels of, of government and the three arms of government, you know. So that hard work of trying to build a critical mass of people around shared sociopolitical ideas cannot be circumvented. It must be done. Mm. Did he ever explain to you why the Senate 
still accepts ministerial nominees without portfolios? For that, for, for that, I can say it's something that he consistently fought against mm. in, in his 12 years in the Senate. This bow and go uh, phenomenon, this ministerial... Screening uh, exercise. ...without portfolios. It makes absolutely no sense. None. And it's... In the article, I'd, it's a low-hanging fruit. You don't need to amend any... You don't need to do anything. There is no way you can screen people for a job and you don't know the job they are going to get. So it is... It, is, it makes absolutely no sense. Mm. Presidents... I don't know why Nigerian presidents are afraid or unable. I don't know what it is. To simply attach a portfolio to the ministerial nominee and send it to the Senate. And I also mentioned how the Senate doesn't do a good job with screening. You can't have 109 people trying to ask one person a cool. Have you ever gone for an interview and you're interviewed by a board of 109 people? It is very inefficient. You have committees. You know, if somebody is supposed to be minister of uh, justice, send him to the justice committee. There might be 20, 25 senators in there. They can spend the whole day. You can screen all ministerial nominees, 43 of them, in one day. Each committee is screening one person, and each person spends an entire day being screened. And we have a really thorough job. These are people that are going to manage. The problem of Nigeria is not, policy, is not really policy, as in, if you read, you see that everybody has ideas. We all know what to do. Our problem is implementation. You have budgets that routinely are not implemented. People write all these beautiful policy documents. Nobody implemented. And what is the greatest contribution of the National Assembly to our democracy? oversight function. They are the ones that can tell if a budget is not being implemented, it is their job to be able to go to that ministry and say, we voted to so and so money for you to build this bridge. Why has it not been built? Explain to... They are the ones, they are the original whistleblowers, the constitutional whistleblowers for the nation. That's their main task, to oversight these things. So you're, you're, in, you're, you're here interviewing people that are going to be you know, in charge of Nigeria's national, critical sections of Nigeria's budget and you're telling them to bow and go. That is the strongest signal you can send that it is business as usual. So I, I feel really sad, saddened by it because it is something like I'm easily, and I'm not saying it doesn't mean that the Senate is antagonistic to the presidency, no. But I, I often talk about the concept of patriotism. Patriotism is loyalty to the nation first, not to the state, that's propaganda. Patriotism is loyalty to the nation. Those legislators are the people's representatives. Your heart should always be with your people before it is with the executive. So when you are screening ministers, you're screening ministers on our behalf, not on behalf of the president. Mm. Do you think it's important that authors, poets, get their voices heard more often? Do you think that they should be more politically involved? Some people say it's art for, art for life or is it life for art? So there's always art that argument. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, in Nigeria... Do you think you should be more involved in what is going on? I do. I, I do not belong to the school of art for art's sake. I, I appreciate writing poetry about the sunrise and beautiful flowers and whatever. It's fine. However, we live in a country where 13 million children are out of school, for goodness sakes. We live in a country where over 50% of our citizens live beneath the poverty line. We live in a country where three out of four people that apply for university spaces can't get in because there are not enough spaces. Live in a country where insecurity is increasing every day and you're singing about the sunrise, and you're singing about beautiful flowers, and you're singing about bling bling and booty shaking. Come on. Come on. We can't be like uh, Nero, you know, fiddling away while Rome is burning. We all need to apply our talents, our gifts, to trying to push this country in the right direction because it's an existential issue. It's an existential issue. We're all in this boat. If it sinks, nobody's going to avoid getting wet. We're all going down with it. Mm. Well, which nation can stand dividing its people? How can one build on foundation so brittle? If we cannot see ourselves in each other, this journey ends here. We're going no further. But that's an excerpt from DK's The Wall and the Bridge. Ponder that. Thank you for coming on Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me.